can't do the details, sorry, but um, yeah, in Oakland we just started bouncing a whole lot of ideas and really what I was bouncing off was what I was seeing other um, farmers around the country doing. And um, Anyway, I didn't really hear um, much from you for a couple of years, uh, although I think um, Jono paid you a visit at some point um, yeah, as well a, a few months later when he, was, when he was passing through the North Island and then um, I got a um, little uh, insight into a webinar that you did with the Greater Wellington Regional Council with, um, among a few other farmers and that kind of stuff and uh, I, I'd intended to just sit there and flick through and just, you know, just be like, oh yeah, what was that? What was that like? I don't really have time to sit down and listen to this, but I'll listen to his presentation start to finish, and I'll, I'll still, I'll still leave wanting more. So, um, and ever since then, um, you've been really looking forward to hopefully getting you up and having you sharing what you've been doing and learning, and just, um, yeah, really excited the, um, yeah, you know, the ideas that you're trying, the confidence that you seem to be doing, doing it with, and um, you've obviously you've got an interesting background in terms of. Um, you know, doing a few different things, not not following the traditional farming pathways and that kind of stuff, and also, um, you know, a technical background with your fertilizer history and things like that, um, and bringing that into this context, I thought would be super cool. So, um, thanks very much for coming and doing all the prep to, to be here, and uh, we'll, we'll let you rip into it. Cheers, Sam. Yep, so, yeah, my name's Ross Johnson, um, farm with my wife, Sammy, over there. Um, our home block is just out of Greytown on um, 150 hectares of very, very stony soil. Um, and then we've got and then we've got another block at the top of Lake Wairapa on um, pretty heavy silts, um, which is an ex-dairy farm and irrigated. Um, so they're pretty contrasting and complementary blocks, I guess. Um, yeah, so the way we farm, sort of typically at Woodside, we do winter dairy grazers, um, which we <coughs> done on winter crop, um, and we finish bulls and graze another couple of hundred bulls, um, and we do a carryover cow trade, which is sort of our workhorses, so we can use them as toppers and cleaning up lanes and stuff. Um, we sell them as in calf, um, autumn carvers. Works quite well. In Diversion Road, um, completely different. We use that as a cash cropping block. Or as a dairy farm. These Both these farms are owned by my old man and we, we lease them. He sold the cows four years ago and he was open-minded enough to let us try something different, so we don't have to get up at four in the morning. <laughs> um, we grow a range of crops, reasonably simple, uh, barley, maize, Italian ryegrass seed, peas, and we've dabbled a bit in hemp and choy some. We usually try a new crop every year and hope for the best. Um, then in the winter we finish sort of two to two and a half thousand lambs and we'll graze dry hobbits in the spring and sort of run a few bulls there and chop and change between the two farms sort of depending on where, where the grass is um, so yeah that, that's sort of how they complement each other it's a pretty good escape route if we're getting in trouble at home um, what else can I tell you uh, some are dry at Woodside our strength there is in the winter. Uh, we've got the ability to winter heavy cattle there, and and it's the opposite at Diversion Road. The strength is in the summer. Um, it is dry, but we get through with irrigation. Um, so what changes are we making? Uh, biggest one at Woodside is we've sort of noticed. We're not that resilient with the way we were cropping. Um, very expensive on the stones. We weren't getting great yields. Um, a good yielding cow crop for us would be eight ton, and that, that's quite an expensive feed. Um, and we're establishing it. We're establishing it going into drought usually. It's just a bit of a lottery as to uh, 
when we're going to get those autumn rains and it's just a race against time to get a crop for those cows to come onto. So we would like to move to a sort of premium pasture based system um, and we're trying adding diverse species into that. Um, for the diversification is to stock enterprises. Uh, being, aside from the uh, the bulls, uh, sorry, the dairy grazers were being all bull, and now we are trying to um, we're, we're doing some wagyu for first light farms. Uh, like the idea of um, having a value added product, um, not just being reliant on that McDonald's market. <coughs> um, like like the company and how they're pitching themselves overseas. Um, and at Diversion Road, we're typically in the past between crops just plant straight Italian rye grass for winter feed. And now we're going down the multi-species cover crop route, which um, we think is key. And um, we're just starting to experiment with the biostimulants now. Um, reasonably keeping it really reasonably simple. Um, so we, we've been working with, with Stephen from BioAg a fair bit. Um, he's been really good, he's got huge knowledge to sort of guide us through that, that process. And Jules has been a massive help, um, uh, who's got a cyclone sprayer that lets us go out and um, she lends that to us so we can go out and get that on for a very low cost. Um, it's been awesome. Um, why are we doing this? I'm kind of surprised to find myself up here. Um, a few years ago, so I'd never have believed I'd be in the room. Um, but it's, there's been no light bulb moment, it's just been a natural progression. Um, basically, observing what's been going on on our farms and looking for solutions, like uh, for example at Woodside, it became pretty obvious pretty quickly that you know, our ryegrass and clover based pastures were not cutting the mustard. Um, There's just no persistence and no resilience, so we started looking at different species um, and at the same time we were developing infrastructure, running out a lot of poly, poly wire. Um, and that sort of developed into cell grazing, naturally sort of increased our stocking density and just started growing more, more grass. Um, then at Diversion Road, we came on there, I was still pretty traditional, I thought I'll get the plough out. Um, which uh, I soon got myself into a lot of trouble there, um, getting wet, wet springs and sort of felt we took a step forward and then two steps back with that one. But we were experimenting with cross slot at the time um, for the contractor and yeah, just started noticing that that soil structure and, and, and the performance was just vastly improved. Um, and those wire cross slotters, um, although they wouldn't definitely consider themselves sort of regenerative, but those guys have been thinking about soil health for 20 plus years um, and they've been a huge influence on me, um, probably my biggest mentors still, um, although they probably consider themselves quite conventional. Um, yeah. And then part of my background in agriculture, grew up on a dairy farm, but um, went out ad contracting for local contractor and there's not a lot of the wire if I have ploughed or disked a million times and uh, it was always neat to visit these cross solids farms and talk to them and, and see what they were just going from strength to strength, um, yields going up every year and it's just uh, that, that really set the seed. So the seed for me um, and yeah I've still got iron sickness so that led me to look for a tractor and a direct drill once I decided that direct drilling was the future. Um, and so looking for that, it sort of introduced me to a few different people. Um, 
the guy that sold me the drill also sold me my first multi-species mix. Um, so, yeah, we thought that was going to take a few. That one was kind of more out of curiosity, um, but we had identified some specific problems like that diversion road. Drainage was poor, right next to the lake. Uh, any water that has to get away has to get pumped over a stop bank. Um, and it soon backs up again in the winter. Um, being a hundred years of dairy farm, it's pretty compact. Um, and as a result, water infiltration wasn't great. Uh, soil organic matter was pretty low. And then at Woodside, contrasting problems, very free draining. Um, in leaching a problem, particularly with uh, green feed crops in the winter. Um, and we all just weren't resilient enough going through that summer. Um, and then, yeah, a few other influences, um, such as this man over here, Colin Shala. He's um, been pretty, pretty active in the Wairapa, pushing things along. And he set us up in a RMPP group which has just been awesome for the support. Um, Yarning to other guys doing the same thing, and yeah, then sort of Quorum Sense has been doing the same thing. Um, yeah, just the technology, being able to, you know, have these guys that have been doing it on your laptop and follow what they're doing, and yeah, it's been awesome. And then uh, one other guy I should mention, we had a casual worker, um, working for us for a couple of years, who was, um, he was pretty alternative. But he hadn't heard of regenerative agriculture either, but he was always badgering me at Smoko and lunch and saying, oh, why don't you use some multi species and, you know, um, all these things that I'd considered. And I was just like, oh, this guy's getting on my nerves. I'll just start doing some reading so I can just shut him up. So, did a bit of reading there and um, yeah, I, I, the more I read the more I sort of thought this could take a few boxes for us. Um, yeah, haven't told him he's probably right yet. <laughs> um, so what have we tried? Yeah, I'll just share a bit about some specific uh, things with, whoa, what's happening? Try so different. Um, so our very first um, mixed species pasture was on the stones at Woodside. Just a list of uh, species we put in there. Um, so that was yeah, about 19 species or something. Might as well give it a decent crack. Um, and I think we were just lucky enough, everything went pretty well. We went into a dry season, um, but we drilled after a cow crop. Drilled into moisture, established really well. Everything really expressed itself. Um, by the time this photo was taken, um, it was basically had rain since the end of October. There's not a green blade of grass on the rest of the farm, so we grazed it with um, 50 artery bulls, 30 days of grazing. They just really went well. 2 kgs a day. Um, what we normally would have done there would have been to put a summer rake crop in, um, which I would normally expect about 1 kg of live weight gain with bulls, um, and it was significantly cheaper to grow. It was about 650 bucks to establish compared to the rake system, which would have been about 600 plus 800 of regrassing in the autumn. But um, this paddock really kicked on nicely. Um, got a bit of rain, all those perennials were nicely established, and um, we got on there again in May, an 80 day round over winter, and um, sort of peak spring growth, we're down to about 24 days. Um, that's our first, first graze um, during that summer. We were just feeling our way really, that's um, probably the best sort of trample we got and here we were a bit lax. Um, I was just shifting daily shifts and, and back fencing. Um, 
and this is up to date. Uh, still, most species are still there. Um, we're really happy with it. Probably, if you could have the whole farm look, looking like that, would be absolutely stoked. Um, then we tried pretty much the same recipe again this last spring, and yeah, didn't get it right at all. Um, so thankfully we had this one first. <laughs> um, basically we sowed into bugger all moisture at our driest October we've ever had, and then it didn't stop raining through November and December, and then it just went snap dry after Christmas. We were left with a few of those bigger species um, for a bit of grazing and all the understory. Um, sort of shriveled away to nothing, so yeah, it's um, certainly no silver bullet. Um, the understory is starting to cover, come away now, but I suspect I'll have to whip out here with the drill and stitch a few more species in. Um, and then down at the other farm, got a few. Oops, no, that's it. Um, a few niggly paddocks um, down at the other farm, where compaction is a major problem. Uh, they're very low lying, um, poorly drained, but anaerobic. So we've done two um, multi-species mixes in there now. Um, just tried to get a bit of different rooting depths and with um, cell grazing with cattle and then had lambs on them over, over winter. First year, um, really struggled to get roots down. Our beans were sort of about that high. Um, radishes were punching in about that deep. Um, and we decided to go again this year. Um, so in a similar mix. Chucked the aerator through first and um, the difference has been pretty cool. Like the beans are up this high and yeah, everything's just a lot a lot nicer. Um, definitely not perfect, there's a long way to go, but you can dig a hole now and find some worms and 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 that pan has really been broken up, which has been really cool to see. Um, that's the previous previous summer, just grazing the um, our two balls on there. Um, carrying on down at Diversion Road um, with the cropping side of things. Uh, we've been trying to grow an understory in our maize crops for the last couple of years um, because we want to persevere with the maize because it's quite a handy. Um, margin, um, put quite a bit of organic matter back into the soil, um, but on our ground we were having trouble with um, traffic at harvest and um, there's a lot of bare ground and we were still ploughing and disking for that and we wanted to get right into no-till. Um, so we did one paddock conventionally this year. Um, with the yeah, full cultivation, normal nutrient program and normal spray program, and then we did um, a second paddock strip till, um, and three days after strip tilling, went out with my drill and sowed an understory of plantain, bursine, and Persian clovers. Um, yeah, with the aim of reducing vehicle damage, getting a bit of land grazing hopefully fixing a bit of end for the maize crop and controlling weeds. Um, results, so this was harvested for silage on Friday. Um, haven't seen the waiver stockets yet, but um, basically yield-wise, both paddocks were the same, just, just from counting the trucks will confirm that when we get, get the results back from the waybridge. Um, yeah, and, and you could chuck bands on it now. It's um, been pretty cool. Um, so I should mention this this one with the understory. We used um, 86 units of N compared to 151 on the other paddock. <coughs> 20 units of P compared to 30. Um, the conventional had a post-emerge atrazine 
we did weed spray um, in the understory because those clovers are quite slow to establish and we were getting a few weeds coming through so we went through the and Valdo. We used a biostimulant program and we used um, we melted cement with a uh, sprayer. Um, so similar growing costs, difference being we're going to have lambs out there in no time. Um, whereas we're going to be eight weeks away from having lambs out on the other one. Um, and we've used Farley symptoms. Um, starting to get hit by aphids pretty majorly and it was actually our our seed and chem rep was like, ah, uh, hold off, don't go into the insecticide. We're starting to see a lot of ladybirds come in. So we held off a week, came back, and they were just demolishing the aphids, and we left it, and that was, that, that was kind of one of my biggest light bulb moments, really, as to what, what potential is. So, yeah, needless to say, I'm really pretty keen to get rid of um, insecticides. Um, and that's just the cost comparison under mixed species cropping compared to winter kale and summer rape. The average cost of, of feed was 9.2 cents with the winter crop followed by a catch crop versus 14 cents um, for the traditional one. Um, just touch on diverse deferred grazing. Um, Guy and um, Jules have touched on this pretty well, but as part of our um, all grass system on the stones, we think this is going to play a huge part. Um, we shut it up a, do a diverse paddock um, in mid October, grazed February, um, density of 380,000 kgs over six hours, which work back to stocking rate is 8.7 balls to the hectare or 3,740 kgs of live weight to the hectare. Um, they didn't perform great, but we were more worried about the paddock. They were already at a pretty good... Um, we could afford to sort of hold these boys back a bit, um, but they still did half a kg a day, which uh, we, we were completely happy with at that time of year. Um, a couple of pictures, that's what the sword looked like. It's pretty ugly, it's a bit of green at the base, but yeah, we were pretty dry at that stage. Um, that's just after we've come out and put a lot of that carbon in, and that's a month later. So what's next? Um, well, we don't have a fixed idea of what things need to be. We're just going to let them evolve, which is kind of how we've been rolling, really. And yeah, just no preconceived ideas, and um, just keep on expanding what's been working, which, in my opinion, is our biostimulant program on the cash crops, um, our grazing trials and amateur food grazing. Um, I'll probably really need to do some more research and work on the technical knowledge. Um, so we've been relying on some pretty clever people to do that for me um, and just jumping in really. Um, yeah, and then the next big ones are have a holiday and just enjoy myself, really. It's <laughs> been <laughs> pretty cool, eh? Yeah, so that's pretty much us. Yeah. Um, so, but before we do that, uh, any questions? We've got four or five minutes um, for Ross while he's here. Um, just the ones you don't want to forget in the break, and then we'll again, we'll take a couple more questions. Um, or Skull, Skull, note them down if we want to save them for the big panel. So, what's top of mind? What's everyone curious about? When you established that maze crop, did you round up that first before you tried to kill it? Yes, we did, yep. Um, we used a lighter roundup. It was in a, um, it had been in pasture for three years at that paddock, just a biograss um, enclosed paddock. It was fairly, it was pretty clean. It was a light, lighter rate of roundup with the hope of uh, seeing some of those clovers come back. And, and we felt that worked pretty well. Andre? Yeah, just curious, uh, the marshing that you applied to the maize crops, was that sort of all in granular form? Or, or do, you, do you use foliar applications at all? Uh, yes, yeah, so we, um, it was mostly granular, um, 
down with the machine. Um, so if we only get one one crack with that, you can't side dress with, with behind the strip tiller. Um, so from memory, I think we went down with 100 kgs of MAP, um, 150 of SOA off the top of my head. Um, which might have been 200. And then we did a folding application when we had Jules's cyclone um, mixed in with our fire stimulant. We melted 30 kgs of urea. Um, did see a bit of a burn, but a few days later it was gone. Jules, question? Yeah, I do. I have, as I personally know, you have a um, history working in the conventional fertiliser industry. And I suppose it's when you come from one paradigm moving to another, do you want to just speak to what's made that possible for you to sort of move sideways in your thinking and therefore your actions? What are your challenges then? How's that been for you? Um, yeah, that's a good question, Jules. Um, <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's been my personality. I'm not too afraid to do things differently. We hadn't, I was never a, I didn't come up through the ranks farming. Um, I grew up on a family farm, but I didn't go shepherding and farm managing. We came home and um, just leased a farm and jump into it, so we're not really tied by convention. Um, well, we certainly started out that way, um, basically because that's what everyone was doing. Um, but I guess it was more about being worried about what was happening within my farm fences, rather than what everyone else was doing. Um, and I could just see that some things were not going well. Um, <coughs> so I started looking around for other ideas. Um, yeah, and so I guess that I, I was balanced rep. Um, I really enjoyed it at the time. Um, and I thought I was really well trained at the time. Um, but probably. Um, Probably coming out of that kind of opened my eyes. Some products that we were selling, um, we claimed to have all the science behind and we could poo poo other people's products. And then, as a farmer, suddenly uh, they've acquired that product and, and the science is suddenly sound. So, um, I don't know, just draw your own conclusions there, I suppose. This might be something to say for the panel later, but while it's in my mind, I'm just wondering um, in terms of um, energy and emissions, you know, you've got amazing machinery and all that sort of thing, uh, presumably dependent on diesel, and um, if we're going to be reducing um, our CO2 emissions and, and thereby um, um, Know, helping with climate change and all that sort of thing. Um, so, how are we going to manage uh, the, the, you know, the transition from this current system to what we might be obliged to do? You know, bearing in mind the cost of diesel might go up. Um, and um, yeah, so because you know it's all part of an integrated approach to how we manage soil, and land, and productivity. Um, but you know, the whole scene is changing. And it's challenging, I would say. Definitely say that one to the panel because I know there's um, that Simon and Myra will, um, actually everyone will probably have their own ways where, where, where that's happening. So thank you for that. Yep. Um, Ross, when you drink through on the dry um, stone management website, were you like smashing tines or did you have to readjust your depth or did you have to build up some um, organic matter on top before you even considered it? or? Um, so I chose my drill pretty specifically uh, when I bought it. It's a, um, oh, probably pretty boring talking drills for most people, but um, it, it's a disc drill that 
Um, it, it's pretty versatile, it handles the stones uh, better than anything I've seen. Um, we demoed a few. Um, and yeah, no, it, it, it's pretty, pretty minimal where we can go through most places with no, not too many worries. Um, we try and, um, going forward, definitely put an organic batter on those stones is, is the way we want to go. Mm. And growing these kale crops, um, by the time the cow, cows are coming up, um, we thought in theory we'd be building organic matter, but we were exposing more stones. Mm -hmm. So that's another reason we're all moving towards that full grass system. But yeah, no, we, we're not afraid to drill on the stones. Yeah. Cool. There's, another, there's another good topic for lunch for those that are in the drill market, and Simon's another wealth of knowledge on that. And I'm sure that, can go, that conversation can go for hours as well. <laughs> um, so I've learned a lot about drills in the last couple of years. Uh, any more before we go for the break? Um, no. Awesome. Sweet. Well, um, well, well, we'll pause there and um, just yeah, again, thanks very much, Ross, um, for that. That was bloody fantastic. Look forward to having you on the panel later. Um, I'll take that from you and let you sit down. Thank you. Uh,